Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Friday, September 10th, 2021. Once again, I'm so happy to be back with Charlie Trimble. Charlie, once again, great to be with you. Great to be with you, David. Charlie, today I'd like to start by asking when you initially had the idea to go off on your own from HP. How did you set about that? What were the decisions and what did you need from HP in order to make that viable? All right. Um, at the end of our last conversation, I think I, I talked a little bit about um, the changing environment in, at Caltech, I had uh, HP, and um, uh, the fact that uh, the division uh, frequency and time division was being run um, by a marketing manager that was afraid um, that technology uh, would warp uh, uh, marketing strategy, and so had uh, had uh, reduced the uh, the timeline on um, on on activities to two years, which uh, completely. Um, destroyed my ability to do anything truly meaningful uh, as engineering manager of an integrated circuit facility. Uh, so at that point, um, I was looking around and uh, uh, with the same reorganization, a Loran C navigation project that Al Bagley had started uh, uh, had been canceled. Uh, they were at final prototype approval, um, and um, uh, HP traditionally, when they cancel a project, they simply shelve it. So I viewed that as an opportunity to start a business and to um, go off on my own. Um, the um, uh, the fellow that um, actually was one step up, he was a group vice president, uh, a fellow by the name of John Blocker, uh, uh, had um, had in his past an entrepreneurial streak. And so I proposed to him that I would buy the, uh, the Loran C project from HP for $50,000. Now, Charlie, at that point, how financially risky was this for you? Did you have a nest egg? Did you have the ability to say, I can accept failure to a certain degree? What did that look like just from a personal finance perspective for you? Um, I was, I certainly, um, I had a nice home that uh, uh, I, had, I had just finished building in Los Altos Hills, uh, which you have to realize in terms of uh, values, um, I was making approximately $40,000 a year, which was a good salary. Um, the home that uh, I had completed in Los Altos Hills was uh, uh, I, I broke the bank at 145,000. Um, I mean, it was it was on two and three quarters acres, and it had a view of the bay, and so you know it was it was really very nice. I mean, but this sets in perspective um, the value of money at the time. Uh, I had um, uh, I probably. I probably was worth half a million dollars in total. Um, so, uh, and I had, I had just bought another lot in Los Altos Hills um, for a hundred thousand dollars that that I had that I had bought for cash um, that I knew I was going to have to sell, but. Uh, uh, I I certainly uh, 
I certainly was going to be okay for the near term. Um, I wasn't really worried about uh, being able to find another job. Um, uh, so I never really, I looked at it as being the time for, uh, to, to do an opportunity. Um, uh, in fact, I can remember when I was thinking about this, I don't know whether it was at this point or during the negotiation with, with HP, uh, I had lunch with, um, uh, uh, one of the Caltech students that I had hired uh, for the IC tester project, who was uh, president of, uh, of of the IC tester company, and they were doing quite well, a company by the name of Megatest, and it was Steve Bissett. So I had lunch with him, and I made a comment about risk, and he looked at me and he said, Charlie, be real. Um, you know, you may have you may have more or less monopoly money, but you're never going to be in a position where you have to worry about a roof over your head or um, or food to eat. Um, uh, you know, there really isn't any risk to doing this sort of thing. So, so in terms of advice, I guess uh, uh, from someone who was junior. Uh, it was well received. Who did you take with you from HP in launching this endeavor? I took three people. Um, I took the key software engineer who I had also hired into HP. And he was the brilliant software engineer that uh, uh, was actually responsible uh, for uh, for the magic um, in the uh, the GPS world, um, uh, a uh, uh, a very bright uh, analog uh, design engineer, um, and I took uh, I took my secretary. Now I have to explain this a bit because when I when I when I got the job of um, engineering manager of the IC facility, one of the things that came along with it was um, was the secretary. Well, I couldn't really see um, how I was going to use full-time clerical help, but I knew that if I hired, if I found somebody for the job that was really bright, they could... Um, uh, they could do something that I needed done. And that was to create a, um, um, an engineering manual on the, um, the five gigahertz FT um, uh, IC process that was the, um, the hallmark of, of the group. I mean, I, I figured that any bright individual could, um, uh, could, could interview um, engineers and, um, and pull together a manual. And so that is what she had done. And so I, um, uh, uh, she came along uh, to um, do all of the things that we didn't want to do, although she made it very clear that uh, um, she didn't do w uh, windows or floors. So so she ended up being uh, the person that uh, dealt with things like purchasing and uh, uh, inventories and that sort of stuff. So anyway, I took three people from, uh, from HP. Uh, a friend of the family was a, um, uh, was a mechanic mechanical engineer, and he joined the company. And uh, uh, I asked uh, my father if he wanted to come in uh, a couple of days a week and keep the books, because one of his jobs at uh, as being manager of the water company um, in Fallbrook was uh, 
he had to keep the books. Um, and I needed someone to, to do that. So um, that is basically how we started out. Oh, yeah. And my father also, um, you know, the, the workbenches we used at, at HP, um, you know, were, were ideally designed for basically electrical engineers. And uh, they cost about $1,200 a piece. Um, I figured out how to design the same functionality for a um, for a material cost of about oh thirty dollars and um, thirty to fifty dollars and um, and my father built them so uh, so that's basically how we started um, we we rented a thousand square feet in a uh, a uh, renovated theater building in downtown Los Altos. Um, uh, the space was, uh, was originally designed for um, um, insurance offices because the thousand square feet had five doors onto the hallway. And uh, so, you know, that was our physical location. Um, and uh, th that was the initial set of people that set out. Charlie, from a funding perspective, did you have any silent partners? Were there loans? Were there banks? H how did you get the funds to launch the business beyond your own means? Well, I didn't. Well, all right, let's put it this way. Um, I... Uh, uh, I refinanced um, uh, my uh, position in an apartment. I was in an apartment house. Um, you know, this is absolutely fortuitous. But d during this period of time, you know, 70, 76, 77, 78, um, you could um, you could buy apartment houses. Um, and, uh, and with 20% down or 25% down and, um, uh, borrow money at a rate, which was equal to, or less than the inflation rate. So, um, I mean, this was, you know, this, this was manna from heaven. Um, and, um, I pulled $100,000 out of an apartment house, uh, uh, which was the principal capital, and I bought stock with that. Um, most of the rest of the people put in $10,000 each, and that was their original stock position. And so on something less than $200,000, uh, we headed off into the wild blue yonder. <laughs> Charlie, was the entire mission of the business from the inception Loran C, or were there other interests and, and, and objectives at hand? Well, hey, Loran, we, we had the good fortune. We ended up being able to buy um, four final prototypes, a rack full of test equipment, and innumerable boxes of... Um, of reading material and other stuff for $50,000. I mean, it, it did take a while for, um, uh, I, I mean, they finally came down to the counter of 80,000, but I refused to budge. Well, they wanted, John Young wanted 200,000 for it, which, you know, from his, his point of view, um, you know, was perfectly reasonable. Um, but I stayed at 50. It became very clear that they gave it to me for 50 because they wanted me to come back if I failed. Yeah. So, so that's how it started. Um, uh, and actually it was, um, the little company that I had was, um, uh, was used for parlor bets among executives at, um, at HP, uh, because um, I found a lawyer that um, 
that uh, had the tech had knew how to put together R and D limited partnerships, and R and D limited partnerships in in those days were things where investors uh, could uh, could take company losses up to ninety percent of their invested investment against taxes. So. Um, so when I started raising money, which I, I did on basically an annual basis, I raised um, um, a quarter to a third of a million dollars a year. I mean, that was what we were burning. Um, we, we were starving. Um, yeah, we all took... Um, I was making 4000 a month. I took two and then uh the engineers were all paid two and um um and um uh kit i think i think started at one but we we rapidly uh, uh moved her to the same to the same salary um this is before i mean this is a long time ago it certainly wouldn't have been uh, been considered today but in any event uh, so we we had a very controlled burn rate, um, and our whole purpose was to finish this, sell it as a product, and then come up with another product. I mean, this was the vision. Uh, we were going to build something one product at a time. Charlie, what were the greatest technological challenges as you launched off on your own business? Well, there really weren't any technical challenges. Um, I mean, uh, figuring out how to sell things was a huge challenge. I mean, you can, you can see how far we had to come uh, we 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 came up with this wonderful product. It was obviously better than anything on the market. We were going to have to sell through uh, marine electronic dealers, and so um, so we had the idea that we would uh, we would premiumly price the product. I mean, HP always premiumly priced their products, um, and we would sell COD. Now. Uh, this is truly an oxymoron when it comes to trying to uh, sell things through a, uh, um, a, a, a small a retail, a, a small retail um, distribution market where the, the companies involved, the marine electronic stores, usually were not big enough to have a good salesman and a good technician. They had one or the other. So the whole idea of being able to um, to sell product COD uh, was um, was certainly not going to work, but we didn't know that at the time. So learning that, uh, putting in place how we got everything manufactured, um, um, you know how we assembled a bunch of stuff. Uh, those were the sorts of problems. Now, yes, the technical problem with regards to our, the innovation, the, H, the HP innovation with regards to uh, Loran C was, it was something that read out in terms of latitude and longitude. Um, you know, the, when the Coast Guard um, uh, designed the system originally, and um, actually it was only a, um, what the Coast Guard had done was upgraded from the design of a Loran A, which was used to guide the fighter planes across the uh, North Atlantic for the Second World War. Um, uh, they, uh, they put in an upgraded system um, really to, to take care of the coastal confluence zone of, um, of the United States. Um, and then it got expanded further around the world. But, uh, but the original concept of that was you made um, you 
you had to receive signals from three different transmitters and you took, so you got a pair of time differences, i.e. the time of arrival of the signal uh, from, uh, from the transmitter. Uh, and this, this gave you a time difference line. And the Coast Guard had these wonderful charts that were overprinted with time difference lines. So that, that uh, by having one of these, uh, these Loran C boxes, you read out two time, difference two time difference numbers, and that gave you a position on a, uh, a, a, a chart, a navigable chart. Um, well, HP knew, and uh, it was really very obvious to other people too, that uh, uh, the time difference lines were off. Um, well, they certainly were off in Los Angeles, and they were off by even more. They were off by about 1.3 miles in LA and two miles in San Diego. I mean, so this is, this is truly noticeable. Well, the technical reason for this is that uh, the speed of radio signals is not is not fixed at the speed of light. Uh, it depends on the conductivity of the material that the signal is going over. So if you're going over dry land, you get one speed. And if you're going over um, highly conductive or irrigated land, you get another. And the anomaly and uh, Los Angeles and San Diego came from the fact that one of the signals that you received down there came down the Central Valley, which was highly irrigated, and the other came down the eastern side of the Sierras, uh, which was basically desert. And so this led to the anomaly. Okay, so the technical problem we had was to, to go to places around the world and find the correction that was necessary to apply to the time difference line so that when we converted from a time difference to a, uh, a latitude longitude, we would come up with a good latitude longitude. And, and so, um, so we did spend, technically we did spend time taking, uh, in fact, we had to take every new receiver because it dealt with second order effects to, uh, uh, to places around the world with known problems. And uh, so this was a technical problem. Uh, it turns out that um, uh, uh, Tom had done, uh, Tom Coates, he's the, the Caltech um, graduate who was doing the software, he had been in charge of the software for this project, for the Loran C project, you know, as it was developed at, at HP. And by the way, HP had uh, put $1.3 million into this development at the time it was canceled. So, uh, so the technical, uh, the, the, um, most of the technical problems with the exception of collecting the, um, um, the error data which would go into a table, uh, uh, had been solved at HP. We just had to implement. I mean, HP was going to do um, um, castings, um, but the the die for the castings uh, hadn't been purchased. And, and so um, uh, we basically had, and we didn't have the money to spend to do that. So, um, so we had to we had to modify stuff and use sand castings and um, and um, and but we, we we basically produced the product the product looked an awful lot like the product that HP had, uh, had had generated you know our goal was to have the thing on the market and 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 making money within a year well, we were selling within the year, but we weren't making money yet. Who were, who were the clients, Charlie? Who, who, who was most excited about these products? Well, 
the the all right the mar the the channel is the marine electronic dealers, but it turns out that because we could read out latitude and longitude, uh, this allowed uh, uh, the sailors that were racing sailboats, ocean racing sailboats, uh, the ability to find the buoys that they were supposed to round in the race without having go having to go to the buoy and pick up the precise um, uh, time difference lines that uh, time difference numbers that would allow them to know where the buoy was. So uh, we found uh, we we found a marine electronic technician uh, that um, that worked the docks uh, for. Um, uh, for some of the major ocean racing series. And um, so the people that really got excited about this um, were those people. And um, what could it do, Charlie? Maybe, sell... Charlie, maybe it's an obvious question, but what could this do that wasn't possible before? Oh, uh, you put in the latitude and longitude of the buoy that you got out of the light list, which was what is published. And uh, you would get a course and distance to destination, which was that buoy. You would get a compass, uh, a, a true north heading and a distance so that it was, it was really easy. It was much, much easier to navigate the boat so that you didn't waste any time. You didn't clear the buoy by more than you needed to. I mean, you know, once you get within, oh, 150 feet, you know, 50 yards or something, and you see it, your perception is it's right there. And so all we had to do was to, was to get answers that were good to the 50, 100 meter region. And people thought that we were spot on. Mm -hmm. um, and then there became, then we started selling these to the commercial fishermen. Uh, and especially there's a wonderful story. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it turns out to try to protect the local fishermen for uh, salmon fishing north of the Bering Straits. Um, I think it was the state of Alaska put down a ruling that um, um, licenses for fishing here uh, could only go to boats that were 26 feet or less in length. And uh, they also had very precise lines of where you could fish and where you couldn't fish. Well, it turns out that that the these uh, Loran Sea units would allow you to uh, um, to not get a foul of the inspectors, and there were there were lots of twenty six foot boats that were uh, barged up north of the Bering Sea to be run by college students. Uh, there would be three. They were they basically fished twenty four hours a day. Uh, the uh, uh, the fish were picked up in their nets by helicopter, delivered to the beach where they were flown off the beach in DC threes. I mean, this was a huge operation. Oh, and by the way, fresh salmon means that it is never frozen. Uh -huh. But it can very well be two years old. It just has to be stored on ice. Uh huh. That's very valuable. Okay, so so anyway, you know these were the types of niche markets we went after. I mean, the um, TI was selling a Loran C unit for a thousand dollars. We were selling ours for um, thirty five hundred. <laughs> Charlie, where is the U.S. global positioning system in all of this? How, how vital is this, having recently launched 
for, for what you were trying to accomplish? Well, first of all, the first GPS satellite didn't go up until what was it? No, it was 76. All right. It did go up. All right. This first satellite had gone up. So I knew that there was a GPS program going on at, um, at HP labs. Um, and, um, uh, it was perfectly obvious that, um, uh, GPS was the right global solution for navigation, but it was a, uh, um, there, the, the design of GPS receivers was grinding through the, uh, um, the military procurement process. And, um, at the time I was doing this, there may be, there may have been, oh, half a dozen GPS receivers in the world. Um, um, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, when I, when I, when I bought the project in 82, um, the, um, the breadboard that I got from, uh, HP, uh, I doubt that there were two dozen that, uh, uh, receivers, uh, uh, in any form that could have worked. Charlie, to clarify, uh, in the, one I, in the, in the 1970s, yeah. GPS was restricted for, for, for military use. Not, it was not available to civilians. Is that right? That isn't true. It turns out there was nobody building any civilian uh, sets, but the GAO had demanded, the GAO forced the Navy, they forced the services to agree on a single satellite system. I mean, the Navy had their system, which, um, um, come on, I'm blocking on the name now, but um, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it's a single satellite that was running around the world, and you got uh, two lines of positions by getting the satellite uh, uh, crossing you um, an hour and a half later than it did the first time. But um, transit, transit is the name of the system. Um, the Air Force wanted to do something along the lines of GPS, uh, and the Navy had transit, and the GAO demanded two things. They demanded that the services agree on one, and that there be a civilian channel for it. So the way the, uh, the system was designed was, all right, since we're required by government to uh, uh, to have a civilian channel, we will have a guide channel for the uh, uh, for the military system that will have limited utility, but will have utility. And so the CA code became the guide code, the guide channel. There was a CA code and a P code. The P code was the military system and the CA code was the, the open channel. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, they published, the reason that HP had something is uh, they, 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 they published everything about the signals. I mean, this was, this was in free market domain. So, uh, uh, so no, there were no civilian receivers. There were the only receivers were the ones that were being built by the aerospace companies that were being competed against each other uh, to build military receivers. There were, there was one class of receiver to be built for aircraft one class for ships and one class for soldiers. 
And the soldier one was, I believe, a 40 pound backpack. I have to look at that number, uh, but it was a heavy backpack. Uh, uh, and, and that was one channel. The, uh, uh, the Navy was going to get two channel receivers for their ships and the Air Force was going to get four channel receivers for their aircraft and their bombers. Charlie, what opportunity did this present to you? I had in the back of my mind that, you know, it's always possible that uh, HP will decide at some point not to continue the GPS. And that this conceivably could become available, but, you know, I'm one of these people that I'm willing to deal with 25% chances and put energy into it. I'm not willing to deal with stuff that has less than a 5% chance of happening. Mm -hmm. And so I, I put the GPS availability at this point in time into the less than 5% category. I mean, that, that was my feeling when we were uh, proceeding uh, with navigation product. I mean, we, we introduced the first product, we generated a second generation product, uh, and uh, 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 I, we realized that, you know, at HP, the time cycle to do a product is three years. Um, uh, you know, the total length of time to, to start from scratch and to, uh, to get a, uh, a, a, a good working product out really took three years. And I came to realize, well, first of all, three years, I would never be able to survive in a commercial market, but then I wasn't going to be able, I really needed to do an annual cycle, but I wasn't going to be able to start from scratch and do an annual cycle. Uh, so, so what we basically did was the hardware cycle was on a two year cycle and, um, on a one year cycle, we, um, we made software improvements, which increased the functionality, um, driven by customer demand. Uh, so, um, and, you know, early in 1982, uh, we were looking at other navigation products and, 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 you know, Magnavox was the only company that was producing a commercial transit system. And they were basically an aerospace company. So I, I looked at aerospace companies as wonderful, wonderful places to compete with. Um, and, um, uh, we found a small company uh, that was that that had a uh, a good prototype transit receiver, and um, we started negotiating to buy the company uh, to get this product and to get something launched in this area. Uh, but fortunately, uh, before we uh, signed anything, uh, I got a visit from. Uh, an old friend at, at HP, it's Franco Fazerink. He was the section manager in, in charge of the section where the GPS receiver uh, was, um, was, was being built at HP. And he came down and said, Charlie, um, I know I advised you not to leave with a RAM project because I thought you were going to fail at it. But you haven't. And as you know, John Young has canceled the GPS project and he's given me the right to sell it. Why, why did, Charlie, because, why did, why did John Young cancel it? What was his thinking? All right. I asked Svanko that. And Svanko said, well, you know, it's really very frustrating uh, because I made a very strong case that this was a billion dollar market. And John Young smiled at me and said, you know, 
we have 50% of a $4 billion market right now in instrumentation. And we have a, what was it? 5% um, uh, position of a um, $400 million computer market. I don't need another $1 billion market that will need another uh, distribution channel. Now, that was the answer that was given to Swanko, and that's the answer that he gave to me. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, we were in the waning days of the Carter administration, and um, uh, there were severe budgetary uh, constraints, and to save GPS, GPS was downsized from a 24 satellite system to a 18 satellite system. I mean, they didn't have the satellites up anyway, but they uh, they they reconfigured things. You mean because um, Charlie, so because of could... the because of the belt tightening of the Carter administration, that's why it was reduced. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so there really was a question about whether GPS would ever be completed. And I believe that that had as much influence on John Young as the stated reason that it was another marketing channel. But he didn't want to get into that discussion or argument. Hmm. And what was your response to this? My response was to go to Al Bagley and say, ask Al, did he think that this system was going to be completed? And he said, I don't know, but I can give you two names that you ought to talk to. One was a fellow by the name of um, Winkler at the Naval Observatory. Uh, who basically is in charge of timekeeping, was in charge of timekeeping uh, for the United States. Um, and the other was uh, uh, a um, Air Force colonel that was leading the GPS, uh, leading the Joint Program Office in um, uh, 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 at, uh, well, it was at LA. I've forgotten the name of the uh, the base that uh, it was being operated out of. But anyway, the uh, but it's the the JPO. Uh, so these were the two people that uh, um, Al gave me uh, uh, contact information on. And I talked to both of them. And. Um, While there was no assurance or no guarantee, and certainly no hard-fisted CFO would have bought it, um, they both fervently believed that this was something that the nation truly needed. Which was what, Charlie? What did the nation and need? So, uh, they needed... They needed this worldwide all-weather navigation system, navigation and timing system. I mean, actually, when we said U.S., we're not talking about the civilian population now. Right. Because clearly, uh, uh, this is being funded through the Air Force, and the total cost of putting up the initial system uh, doing the initial system was $10 billion, okay? So the, uh, the equities that had to, be, uh, had to be preserved were the U.S. military equities. Charlie, when Ronald Reagan came into office, what did that mean for your business, both, both in terms of the regulations, in terms of the budget, 
even the national security aspects? Well, it turns out uh, the easy answer is nothing directly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we, um, we did not show up anywhere. Um, the, uh, I mean, certainly the, the, the Reagan pronouncement with the downing of the Korean airliner, um, uh, which was, uh, 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 claimed to be a navigational error, uh, which guaranteed, uh, the availability of, uh, civilian GPS to everybody in the world, uh, turned out to be an incredibly important pronouncement and was of great use later. But at this point in time, or when things were starting, um, uh, you know, there weren't receivers. Uh, we had, there was no way, I mean, it was one thing to build the Loran C receiver, which was at a final prototype stage. But what I got as a breadboard from, uh, from HP was an existence proof for a civilian, the use of a civilian receiver. Uh, I mean, it, it took up the space of uh, a large kitchen table or a, or a small dining room table. In any event, it could be placed on the, the table in a rented motor home and driven around the freeways of uh, the Bay Area and put plots uh, once every, I believe, 30 seconds on over on a map and, and show that they were on the freeway and furthermore show that the maps had an error at one point because the GPS points did not line up with a map. And it was then that we realized, or I realized, that the way that Rand McNally and other people that spent oodles of money in producing their maps, the way they could sue people for copying was to find the purposeful errors that they had put in their maps on the, the competition's map. So, uh, so, so HP had proven that the civilian signal was sufficient to be useful and was an awful lot better than the military thought it was going to be. Uh, and when HP decided they, they weren't going to pursue this, they published their findings um, and they published their demonstration. Uh, this, now fortunately, there was no commercial market for this or somebody else might have tried to bid on this thing against me, but uh, Why, Charlie? Why was there no commercial market? Oh, it was going to be years before there was going to be a full system in place uh, before people could truly use it. This term breadboard, what does that mean? <laughs> it's a term of art used by electrical engineers to to indicate uh, the concatenation of uh, a series of components that that uh, that produce the function that is necessary to prove out a concept. Uh, I mean, in addition to 
there was an awful lot of analog circuitry, microwave circuitry, uh, coax cables going from one place to another, waveguide, uh, uh, circuits. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it had to be run from a uh, computing calculator. Uh, it didn't have its own computer. Um, but it did. Uh, it did receive signals and it was able to compute a position once every 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, clearly one wants instantaneous update, but uh, in those days, uh, 30 seconds was Nirvana. <laughs> now, Charlie, during this time, what were the sales figures for Loran C looking like in the early 1980s? Did you see long term that this would remain central to your to your business? I knew perfectly well that it was it was good as a few million dollar a year project uh, product line, but it certainly wasn't going to build a major company. Because sales, um, why? You know, because it, sales would be few, flat. No, but it's going to be small. I mean, it's going to probably be capped at ten or fifteen million total. Simply because it's a niche product, you're saying. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, in 1982, uh, we were close to break even. I mean, that's why we could we could entertain you know buying something else, uh, although uh, we weren't we were we were making enough money that we didn't have to raise more than a quarter of a million dollars a year is what break even means. Uh, we were about $2 million a year. When did you commit to drafting the GPS block diagram? When chronologically does that begin? All right. There was... Basically a six month negotiation. I have, I, I, you know, it could have been four, it could have been eight. But anyway, it, it was somewhat protracted. John Young again wanted $200,000. Uh, this time HP Labs had only spent a million dollars. I didn't, I, I got a breadboard. I would get a breadboard and 14 feet of reading material. This is what I was buying. I offered 50 and finally to close the deal, I settled at 80,000. Uh, oh, and to make life slightly more difficult, Swanko had said, one of the conditions of your buying this is you can't hire any of my engineers. Okay. What was your response? So I agreed. Well, I agreed uh, because how else was I going to buy it? Right. Uh, but I said, how about consulting? And he said, I don't have a problem with consulting. So uh, we, uh, the design that they had was 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 a conventional, well, conventional in the um, in the sense of um, satellite radio receivers, a five-stage down converted signal with a with a fourteen-bit A to D converter. Uh, uh, so it it really was a quite conventional uh, receiver design. Uh, I knew, I knew that I had to come up with an approach uh, that would get me to being able to sell GPS functionality for $100, or the Japanese would teach me how to do it. I mean, this goes back to your question, was I aware of the Japanese? Um, and so I knew that 
the receiver had to be digital and we had to generate a block diagram approach that we could iterate on an 18 month schedule, which matched the Moore's law schedule for integrated circuits. And, and, and even though it's famous, Charlie, can you describe what that schedule was, what Moore's law schedule was? Yeah, basically a doubling in speed uh, and complexity uh, every 18 months. And you saw this and, as and an imperative. Having, you and needed having a problem. A, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No question. Uh, and we spent a year to get there. You know, we have no money. We're... We're, you know, we're we're on the edge of um, continuing to survive, and yet until we have an approach, we can't afford to start. And so, uh, actually, it was the gosh awfulest project uh, leadership position I'd ever had. Um, uh, we had uh, Wednesday night consulting meetings. The uh, consultants were paid in stock and pizza. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, there were a core group from the group that designed the, uh, the receiver at HP. Um, everybody bought in to going digital. Uh, and so, and we, don't ask me now, well, I'd have to work pretty hard at them now, but we identified that there were seven different breakthroughs that we had to have to be able to, to accomplish this. And so what we did was, oh, and we also, yeah, I was aware that, you know, consultants are most useful um, for solving really tough problems. They're not all that useful for implementing stuff because you get far more than you have to pay for with intriguing problems because you got you get commute time and you get shower time so if if, if you can if, if 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 you can find a consultant in an area that you need and you can intrigue them with a problem that isn't obvious how to solve in their area um, you get amazing things out of this. So anyway, we went through and we we kept going through consultants until we got our breakthroughs. Now, we never, we didn't usually get the breakthrough we were really looking for. And so we had to shift the pieces around a bit, but we ended up getting, getting them. Now, I had, I had the start because of my experience with a signal averager and understanding how to pull signals out of the noise and understanding that you can turn Shannon around. Uh, Shannon tells you how much information you can pass through a channel given a, a given signal to noise ratio. I wanted to know what signal to noise ratio the, ch the channel had to be at so that I had less than one bit per sample so that I could get away with a hard limiter instead of an A to D converter. And I could deal then with one bit math. So that was mine. Um, the, um, uh, but clearly that would not have been enough to have accomplished things. And, um, and truly out of this group of, um, of 20 consultants, um, we ended up with a block diagram in a year. And then it took, it took me, it took us close to a year uh, to build the first three or four receivers. Charlie, take me through the visuals. What does the block diagram look like physically? Uh, it can be drawn on, uh, actually, my seminal patent in the, um, in the, uh, the GPS arena uh, has a, um, 
a little uh, block diagram that could be put on a three by five card with uh, a dozen blocks. And why then a year, all of these consultants, why all of the man hours necessary for producing this? Oh, because it's easy to do something complex. It is really, really tough to do something simple. Ah, that's great. And why is simplicity prized in this application? Oh, well, first of all, I had to get to being able to sell the damn thing. I'm sorry, sell the thing um, and make a profit at a hundred bucks before the Japanese did. So it's a race. Yeah, it's a race. Charlie, is it a race I mean, I, from an is it a race from an intellectual property perspective or from a securing clients perspective or both? Well, both, but also from a marketplace standpoint. Um, I mean, the the HP vision for uh, uh, the this product was car navigation. That was the billion dollar market that uh, uh, that Sfanco saw. And we knew we knew the pricing because um, uh, I can't remember what year, but it was at some world's fair. Chrysler had, had, uh, proposed a car navigation system. And, um, it was the talk of the fair. And as a matter of fact, car navigation showed up in, um, uh, in um, in in the uh, 007 in a 007 movie with a uh, with a BMW I believe before they ever existed um, and uh, uh, we knew that to get real traction in the automotive industry uh, it had to be an option not an add-on um uh, and at the time the most expensive option was an air conditioner 750 dollars okay uh, so that says that, that if the gps could be an option at 750 dollars uh whatever was sold to the car company car companies will not deal without uh, marking up factory costs by a factor of three. So that says that the maximum amount that a car company is willing to pay is going to be $250. Well, given the display and the other stuff with regard outside of GPS, the GPS component could not be more than $100. So that fixed the $100 price. What year is this, Charlie? Orient me in the chronology. When is the block diagram completed, and when do you know that it's viable? Block diagram is completed in 83. I have working receivers in 84, and I sell my first receiver in September or October of 84 for $100,000. And where, if anywhere, are the subcontractors in your business? Are you farming anything out? Or is your vision that this is a vertically integrated operation? Well, I, I'm on the first product, I, can't, I, I don't have the time to do an integrated circuit. So I have to build, I have to build the stuff out of, um, uh, out of available um, integrated circuit chips. And... By this time, there are microprocessors, and I'm using I'm I'm using 6809s, which are uh, which were the the motor 
neural processor, which were used as controllers in the automotive industry. And they're frankly better than the, uh, the original uh, 8080 um, that went into, uh, uh, that, that, that went into the early uh, uh, PCs. But, um, but that was the microprocessor and I had logic um, and I had memory. Uh, my printed circuit boards had to be, uh, uh, had to be fabricated, obviously. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, we bought some expensive components, and I guess you could say those were subcontracted, but, but they were really at the component level. Um, oh, and the original receivers, um, because I knew I had to sell these things at very high prices, I had to make them look expensive. So while I knew that um, the, the GPS, the satellite signals itself, um, could provide the precision timing, I bought the most expensive crystal oscillator as a standard for um, for the product. And um, it was an HP uh, crystal oscillator, which at the time was selling for um, for $1,300. And so that was, that ended up being the, the total factory cost, the total, yeah, the total factory cost of the, the, the receiver that I had uh, was three thousand dollars. So this one component was nearly half of it, but it um, uh, it it actually served two purposes. It um, it served the purpose of uh, lending uh, the aura of value, and also uh, providing a standard which actually was useful in the timing market. And the timing market was, was actually my first volume deal. What does that mean, volume deal? I, for $20,000 a piece, I sold 20 timing receivers with a, um, a late delivery penalty, which was absolutely severe. And as a matter of fact, the only reason I got the art order, order was the customer was the customer who was a, a company uh, was absolutely convinced that I wouldn't be able to produce the 20 um, on the schedule that was promised. This was a challenge to you. Well, hey, in the early days, you end up betting your company more than once a year. <laughs> um, I was truly happy when I got to the point that I didn't have to bet it more than once a year. And Charlie, for that bet, being able to meet that goal, what were the key challenges? Was it manpower? Was it money? What was it? Well, first of all, I'm sure if I had had a lot more money, life would have been a lot simpler, but... Um, uh, we, my entire career had been, um, um, growing up with very little. I mean, that was true at HP and it was true here. Um, uh, so, um, all corners that could, could be, uh, shaved were shaved, um, in, in such a way that it didn't affect the, the, the outcome, but no, it's just the logistics. Um, I mean, large number of components. Um, you can't order a long ways ahead because you don't have the money to order a long ways ahead. Um, uh, there are a hundred things that can go wrong in any given day. Um, and some of them do. I mean, it isn't... Um, I mean, this is the, this is the part of the business that um, I I firmly believe that um, people that can be Caltech professors could not stand to drive through.
Charlie, what, what were some of the unforeseen challenges, even ones that could existentially threaten the business? I'm thinking, of course, about the Challenger disaster. Before that happened, well, did you have any inkling that such a, such a disaster might, might really threaten the whole basis of your operation? Well, hey, it turns out there are a thousand reasons that something will fail. It, it actually, for those things that you have zero control over, it makes zero sense to think about. And yes, I will tell you about the, the Challenger disaster and what we had to do, but, uh, uh, but, but assuming, figuring out that we were going to protect ourselves against the Challenger disaster, um, you know, given, given what we knew we had to do, I mean, basically, uh, before the Challenger disaster, there were only a few satellites in the sky. I mean, it started out with five, and it had gotten up to seven by the time the Challenger disaster. So we were having to, we were having to figure out how to, to produce product that made money for our customers because we weren't selling to the government, made money for our customers with the the availability that existed in the satellites and this is one of the reasons that no one else wanted to play this game because who in the world wanted to play with uh, the transient behavior of um, um, the early build out of a major system no our problem was we knew we had to be a 50 million dollar a year company by the time uh, the system was completed or we would never be able, we would be swamped by the, the capital resources of the people that uh, were, uh, were thundering uh, after the opportunity. Charlie, tell me about the Challenger disaster. What was that day like for you? Uh, very chilling because uh, to save money, GPS, to save money for the shuttle program, GPS, it was decided, would be launched into orbit from the shuttle. So you didn't have to pay to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to get the satellite to near Earth orbit. Uh, all of the rockets that were capable of launching, I mean, the early GPS satellites were launched on um, refurbished Atlas boosters that were coming out of uh, ICBM silos. And um, I believe with the seventh satellite that went up, they had gone through that in inventory. So we, uh, we were looking at an indeterminate length of time for the U.S. to develop a rocket launch capability that could launch a GPS satellite. And we were looking at a uh, constellation of seven satellites which had been grouped so that testing could be continued at the Yuma, Arizona test facility, i.e. they needed five satellites over there once a day. Uh, aging and how long would the Air Force be able to baby the satellites that were up there along um, before they started losing some of them. Why did so, they, Charlie, why this, did they need to be babied? What does that mean? Well, uh, you know, all satellites that go up have a design life and most of the design life of things um, 
at least in those days with three to five years, uh, they have, uh, they, they manage to stay uh, in orbit, in precise orbit because of expendable fuel. Uh, uh, they have um, momentum wheels, which can take out certain, um, uh, certain anomalies, uh, uh, but uh, but those start to freeze up. Um, uh, the rubidium and or cesium standards, which are redundantly set up, start to fail. Um, all of these things happen. I mean, the Russians, for example, were able to launch lots and lots of satellites in their GLONASS system. But the reason, I don't know whether it's, they have a full system now or not, but certainly during my tenure worrying about this, they never did because their satellites had a mean time to failure of six months. So, uh, so in any event, um, uh, it was, all of the navigation related markets were on hold. Charlie, and maybe we it's were... a, maybe it's an obvious answer, but why exactly did the GPS program go on hold after the Challenger explosion? Was it just a was it just a matter of getting up to space or were there regulatory challenges as well? No regulatory challenges. It was totally Figuring out how to get to get rocket to get satellites up to space. What and is they the, were working that problem really, really hard. Are, are you, in retrospect, is it surprising to you that the shuttle was the only game in town? No, it's um, uh, you know, the people that make budgetary decisions aren't necessarily the people that worry about um, worst case scenarios. Yeah. So what did your company do during those three years? How did it pivot? How did it stay afloat? Wonderful story. Okay. So the, 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 the near term, the near and intermediate term thrust of the company up until the shuttle disaster had been navigation. Uh, uh, you know, car, air, uh, marine. Marine, we were still fine with, okay? You don't need updates very often. Uh, uh, car, uh, we, had, uh, we had signed a major license agreement uh, in fact, we had gotten $5 million from Pioneer for um, technology for car navigation. And they were continuing to want stuff from us. Aviation, we were on the cusp of getting uh, major contracts from two of the major business uh, aviation companies. Uh, but they hadn't been signed at the time that the shuttle disaster occurred. And of course they went bye-bye. Um, now, uh, several months earlier, uh, we, we had, we had recognized that there was a non-navigation market. Uh, I mean, we had been selling, um, GPS receivers into the um, um, the oil survey industry um, for quite some time. I mean, they were first used to uh, to recalibrate um, um, the radio positioning systems that the the companies used, and uh, and later um, uh, they were being used in differential mode to uh, to actually uh, uh, establish precise position for their drilling platforms and that sort of stuff. Um, but we knew that there, there was a, a very major commercial 
first order survey market. Uh, this is where people, uh, first order survey requires that you, you maintain an accuracy over the, uh, um, over the distance of um, one centimeter per kilometer. And uh, so um, uh, we were, um, uh, you could, we were, we, we had come up with the idea of, of uh, doing differential phase carrier GPS. So, you know, all the navigation stuff relies on the signals that the, uh, uh, that are added to the carrier uh, frequency, uh, you know, to give the information about what the satellite orbit is and, uh, and, and satellite health information and a bunch of other things, the 50 bit per second uh, signal. But, um, you can use the physics of the carrier frequency itself um, in a differential mode uh, to, uh, uh, to get very, very high accuracy. Your only problem is you need to know on what cycle of the carrier frequency you're on. And, you know, this this because the, uh, uh, the, the changes, um, you know, occur at the satellite and then propagate through, uh, through space. So uh, you need to know the cycle number. Well, that really is pretty difficult because, um, you know, light travels <laughs> at, uh, light travels at, um, uh, a foot per nanosecond, and um, your uh, your your the wave that you're dealing with um, uh, probably has a wavelength in the the foot foot and a half. I've forgotten what the number is now, but um, uh, it's it's easily derivable. Uh, but anyway, it's it's in the in the foot area, and so you actually need to measure the difference in phase of signals coming uh, to your receiver at a known location and your receiver at an unknown location. And from this information, you can calculate precisely or roughly precisely, um, uh, certainly within the accuracy of, uh, of um, first order survey, um, the location of your unknown point. So we had a engineering effort. Um, engineering actually at this point had been split into the stuff going after navigation and the um, uh, this this area. So all of the all of the high accuracy stuff, all of the system level stuff where we were using um, we were using differential techniques to enhance the accuracy um, were in one engineering group and the navigation activity was in another navigation group. Um, and um, we were really close. And as a matter of fact, um, It was promising enough that just before the shuttle disaster, we started trying to market these survey grade receivers. So when the shuttle disaster blew up, um, our, only, our only fallback really, our, our only new market to drive things forward were um, uh, had to do with uh, survey grade receivers. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think it was in February, uh, we got an order for seven of these systems from Caltrans. Uh, what is Caltrans, Charlie? Um, come on, it's the it's the California State Organization that 
does all the survey activities uh, with regards to highways, um, but they probably have, they have probably responsibility for a lot more than just the, uh, um, the survey aspect. I think they have, they have a lot of uh, transportation. In fact, they probably are the Department of Transportation for the state of California. I see. That's a guess. I mean, you know, my, I, and the reason the guess is there is uh, uh, I've heard Caltrans used in, uh, in, in a very general sense, um, having to do with uh, a train system. And, uh, uh, but our whole interface had been at, in the uh, survey aspects of the, of the department. In any event, um, but we were having a problem. Uh, the, the baseline that we were repeatedly measuring on this um, uh, was between uh, Ron Hyatt, Ron Hyatt it was leading this whole effort, uh, between his house and um, our facility. And uh, that was 7.9 kilometers uh, difference in distance. But we were getting two answers that differed by 12 centimeters. We got to the point that we figured out which was the right answer, but we clearly had to find what was wrong, find the bug that was involved in, um, um, uh, in the second answer. And so the end of March, I, I didn't, I said, we don't ship. We're not going to risk an early market um, with something being wrong with the equipment. Now, uh, even with the shuttle disaster, I wasn't overly concerned because I had had a commitment from our local bank that if I produced 10, if I could show them that I had produced 10% after tax net in 85, um, I would have a line of credit for a million dollars. Um, but that million, that, um, so, and I, and I did that. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, I, there, there was some money in the bank because um, uh, I got to the 5 million by getting Pioneer to give me an option on a license. And uh, they gave me a million dollar uh, option on a license, which made my $5 million a year, gave me my 10% after tax net. And our accountant said, yeah, but hey, if the deal closes, before we finish closing the books, we'll count it. If it doesn't, uh, we won't. And I have a story associated with that. Oh, one. I want to hear. This is great. Tell me. <laughs> Okay, um, so in early February, I am traveling to Japan for a signing ceremony with, um, uh, with Pioneer um, for this contract. I get to the airport, I get picked up by uh, the head of our office there, who's an agent, and as he's driving me out of the airport, he said, um, oh, Pioneer has given me their counter proposal. Now, if I know, if, if I knew then what I know now, I would have called their bluff and said, Harrow, take me back to the airport. I'm flying home. 
because I knew they desperately wanted it. They just didn't understand what we were asking for. Uh, because what we wanted was in addition to the money, we would give them a right to put an engineer in our engineering lab, but we had a right to put an engineer in their engineering lab. That we would be able uh, to buy the same manufacturing equipment that they had for production, or they would help us with that because the Japanese only usually sell their new production equipment to, um, to indigenous suppliers. They sell second generation stuff around the world. Um, and thirdly, that we have a right um, to um, buy through um, your purchasing components. Now, they were really happy for the, for the money. They, they were nervous about the engineering. And the other two were really tough for them. Why? What was so tough about the other two? Well, as I found out later, um, um, they had to work some magic to be able to get uh, to allow us to buy some of the automated uh, production equipment that we ended up buying later. And uh, uh, the Japanese don't buy components the same way we do. Um, they find a supplier that makes a component that works and they say, freeze it. You cannot change any part of your process. So they don't buy on the basis of a spec. They buy on the basis of performance. This works because it's performance in the particular circuit that they're building that matters. And it turns out, as we later found out, this it was absolutely key to the way they were getting much lower cost of manufacturing. Um, so anyway, I said, all right, I figured that I should be able, I should be able to put what we want through their words in a contract. So we started the following day negotiating. Now, I'm one of these people that truly needs eight hours sleep. As a matter of fact, I had left, I had moved off campus at Caltech because of sleep deprivation. Um, but the, the negotiation would start at about 9.30 in the morning. It would quit at about seven o'clock in the evening. We would go back to the office and I had our, I, I had a, a wonderful associate lawyer with, with Wilson Sonsini who was handling, who was backstopping me on this thing. And so we would send him the state of the negotiation where things okay, were this is David Seeler. and what we needed with regards to, to wording. And we would complete that by about... Oh, 1130 at night and then go out and get a bowl of noodles and uh, flop uh, resuming at somewhere between three and four in the morning to get the lawyers responses, which were put together and we were ready to go back to the negotiating table at eight o'clock. We left and spent an hour getting across Tokyo to where we were doing our negotiation, and we were there at 9.30. This went on for four days. I had 
two nights of two hours sleep and two nights of four hours sleep. Um, and at the end, they uh, took us out to one of these, um, these ancient geisha restaurants where, uh, uh, where the geisha girls uh, would feed you and dance for you and sing you sing for you and they had uh, um, you know I don't know 25 35 two dozen three dozen four dozen different tiny tidbits of something most of which you didn't want to ask what it was <laughs> um, uh, you know it was probably three to five thousand dollars a plate and uh, the uh, head patent attorney for pioneer came over to our uh, came over to our agent i mean our uh, manager and said you know this is the first negotiation i've lost all right so that secured the deal um, and so that had secured the, the, uh, $5 million for, um, uh, 19, 1985. Now, uh, we're, we're at about the fifth or sixth of April and our bankers have come over and, you know, I, I do the same thing, you know, I, I give, I'm perfectly honest with regards to the good news and the bad news. And um, um, I said, uh, um, unfortunately, we've got a bug in the software. And so we did not ship these units. And um, therefore, we um, uh, were, were going to show a loss in the first quarter. And uh, the banker looked at me and said, um, you know, Charlie, Banks are not in the habit of giving money to people who are losing money. Why don't you get things straightened out? And when you are, um, when you're back profitable again, let's talk again. And oh, by the way, the $600,000 that you borrowed from us uh, to pretty up your balance sheet. We'd like it back. Well, actually, it was $500,000 that I had borrowed. I had $600,000 in the bank. I negotiated to give him back only half of it. Okay, this was the morning this all occurred the morning of the annual meeting. Now, uh, I most people might not think that this is the right way to approach business problems, but uh, I fundamentally learned a long time ago that it's better to ask for permission. I mean, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> so I did not, I, I certainly did not pose to counsel what I was going to do for the annual meeting. I um, took the view that the annual meeting was to discuss what went on last year. And that is what I did. And of course, everybody was happy. And as we, uh, as, uh, I walked with the board to um, this little room, which uh, didn't have a window, but we called the boardroom. Uh, the sole venture capitalist on our board, he was a seed venture capitalist, um, said, you know, it sounds like this is really becoming a good company. So the door closes and I say, well, you've heard the good news. Here's the bad news. So I tell them about the problem with the uh, the bug in the software. 
and I tell them about uh, the reaction of the banker, and I'm asking for ideas. I need help. Well, they came back with suggestions such as factoring receivables at 30% interest, the sale and lease back of uh, capital equipment, but nothing else. And then saying, well, maybe we ought to have a meeting again in a month. Okay, that was the board meeting. Uh, went home, didn't sleep well. And I finally came to the conclusion that, you know, it was frankly easier to make money than to raise money. So the company at this point in time had about 100 people. We were just starting to fill out mid-level positions. So uh, I eliminated uh, I, I eliminated the mid-level positions, and we all took a Hewlett Packard um, pay cut. All right. Okay, that was, and by the time we got to the next meeting, um, uh, we were, uh, well, not by the time we got to the next meeting, but from May on, we were profitable every month of the year. Um, now back to the, uh, back to the bug in the software. Um, the software that was pulling the whole system level thing together was a brilliant Iranian. I had hired him um, early on in, um, uh, in the building of GPS. And uh, uh, at the time, he worked for me uh, at night. He worked for Intel during the day, and Intel got him a green card. And once he got the green card, he left Intel, and he joined me forever. Anyway, he was, he was brilliant, but he was paranoid that Ralph Eschenbach who was now leading the, who had been leading the the, uh, the whole effort with regards to the navigation side of the business, um, and who had come up with the GPS receiver in the first place, he was afraid that Ralph Eschenbach would claim credit for finding his bug. And for, Several months now, we had been working really hard to get Javad uh, some extra help. Uh, and the, the person we had chosen was a fellow by the name of Tim O'Allison. He had gotten a PhD in GPS, by the way, out of Leeds University in England. Um, he was the first of the uh, English PhDs that we hired. Uh, he was brilliant, had no ego, and was the kindest and softest person you could ever imagine. Well, Javad would barely talk to him. So uh, Timo had to infer from the changes in software from day to day where Javad was looking for the problem as he as he uh, you know tried to reconstruct what the entire program was and uh, he uh, but he discovered one day that um, 
the machine language code had changed, but the object code had not changed. So he wrote an inverse compiler and he found that Javad had changed something and then gone back and changed the option, the object code. Um, this was known the following morning. And when I arrived at work at about 8.15, first person to st storm into my office was Tom Coates. He said, it's either him or me. He should be fired for trying to conceal code. Uh, okay, I certainly wasn't gonna lose Tom. I was really annoyed at Javad. I thought that, damn it, he didn't have to worry about Ralph Eschenbach. He would get all the praise in the world for finding that bloody thing. So I had to figure out how to handle the situation. And uh, I, um, I picked the fellow who was a um, retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and he had been in the Joint Program Office, and he actually was uh, in charge of the military portion of our operation at the time. I said, all right, I want you to investigate and tell me what has happened and recommend to me what should be done. Um, this is the chief way that you normally use consultants for. Uh, well, he did, and it turned out it, Java did it. Uh, so I fired Java. Um, and of course, he sued. Uh, and um, I was really livid about this, but the insurance company settled out from underneath me. Uh, in any event, Javad then went on to be our major competitor in all of the high accuracy markets. He ended up forming three different companies, which he sold to three different parties. Um, so all of this happened, and it happened around the tensions of the, uh, the shell disaster. So, you know, when it rained, Ains it pours. <laughs> Charlie, was it about this time that you saw the company being viable on a long-term basis? Well, I certainly believed that we had a huge runway in front of us. And it was it wasn't just then, but the the, uh, the penny dropped as to what the real opportunity was uh, somewhat later. Give me a couple minute break and I'll be right back. Sure. I'm back, Dave, but, you know, as I'm thinking about it, certainly 
certainly in the May timeframe, when we had solved the um, uh, the problem, uh, you know, the the twelve centimeter problem, uh, the um, and we had shipped the units to Caltrans, and we started on the road to profitability. Uh, no, uh, we were just three months after the shuttle disaster. Uh, uh, the the whole future was totally clouded. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we had one more Hail Mary maneuver to go through um, before um, we got to the other side. And how and, many people were on, so, Charlie, how many people were on staff at this point? How many salaries were you responsible for? Uh, roughly 100. Wow. I mean, I, well, wait a minute. It, it went down. It was... Uh, it was a hundred before the cut, so at in in June it was probably ninety eighty five. And what was this hail mary? Well, okay, following year, um, we had been selling these GPS receivers into Japan um, for earthquake monitoring, um, and. Uh, uh, the USTR, US Trade, uh, had been pushing the Japanese to buy American products, you know, much the same way uh, things during the Trump administration, uh, Trump administration was pushing China to buy stuff from the United States. And uh, so uh, uh, they were looking around. Now, this was June of... Uh, was it 87? I think it was 87. I think it was 87. Um, they have to go back and look. But uh, it was around June. Um, our, our agent from Japan uh, called me and said, you know, uh, the Japanese are under pressure to buy stuff. And uh, uh, the government would like to buy three dual frequency receivers. Well, first of all, um, there were no dual frequency survey receivers. Secondly, there is no CA code to help you figure out which cycle you're on. Um, and uh, he said, you know, they're willing to, uh, they're willing to pay, well, they're asking for a bid. And so, okay, I don't remember, but we, we, we bid a high price and, and it was, they were, they were happy with that. Um, I said, you know, we've never seen L2 energy from space. Uh, but, you know, we certainly, oh, the delivery date is the 1st of April, okay, the following year, April, uh, that, yeah, April 1988. Um, and, you know, the deal with the J Japanese government is if they sign a contract with you and you fail to deliver on the delivery date, by the delivery date, you will be forever barred from doing business for the Japanese government again. So, all right, I I said yes. We we can build three of anything. Three weeks later, he comes back. No, they really want ten. I said, Hero. We have never seen the energy from space. And he kept pleading. I said, all right, we'll figure out how to do can. But this is really tough. Three weeks later, he comes back. Two weeks later. No, the number is 25. And I said, Carol, 
you know that we haven't seen energy from space. The only thing we have is simulator signal. He said, oh, that's going to be fine. All right. Middle of July, well, my three weeks obviously don't add up because it was about the middle of July. Um, um, Tim will finally become free. I mean, this is the same guy that found the bug in the other one. And uh, uh, we know precisely what the signal is supposed to look like. We know the frequency. We've got an awful lot of information. But Timo starts looking for the signal. And uh, he doesn't find it. And the Japanese ask for data. We send the data and say, Hiro, you know this is simulator data. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Three days later, Japanese say that it was simulated data. And I say, yeah, that's all we have. And he said, well, uh, they've given me 48 hours to give them data or the deal is off. Now, the whole reason I took the 25, knowing that I was risking the company, was, you know, if a satellite fails, we're done for. The, our current market uh, basically contracts something fierce. Um, and who knows when the GPS satellites, additional GPS, oh, and who knows when additional GPS satellites are going to get into space. So it's better to put the risk on what we can control than on what can be controlled by other people. Well, anyway, The night before the due time, due date, Timo saw and recorded the first L2 information from space. That was sent. We, um, the Japanese were very happy with it. We got the order for 25 units. Charlie, now, can you explain, can... how do you record this information? How does that work technically? Um, you've got a receiver that is tuned to, um, um, I'm not positive whether Timmel actually, um, I mean, we, we had the amplifiers that were set up to receive, uh, L2 energy, um, uh, on the receiver and he probably jury-rigged a real receiver to be able to um, um, uh, he may very well have done it in software he may have uh, he may have been uh, it probably meant that he was able to track the uh, track the carrier as the satellite moved and um, uh, by tracking the carrier as the satellite moved, uh, then the same set of algorithms that uh, could be used for uh, for the, the L1 signal could be used on the L2 signal. I don't, I, I honestly don't know specifically uh, what computer file he sent them. What was so significant about being able to do this at that moment? No one else had ever done it. To have to have basically tracked the tracked L2 energy from space uh, without being able to use the military code that was on the signal. Uh, I mean, this required several orders of magnitude of pulling signal out of the noise.
I mean, it, it, it clearly was, and the only other person that ever did it, seeing that we had done it, was Javad. Nobody else was ever able to do it. What happened next? Well, next we had to build and ship and deliver the units. So I hired an old friend from HP um, and um, uh, that um, very bright, he had a brother that was very bright. He was rebelling as a kid. And so instead of going to college, he went into the army. Uh, he made it to sergeant, um, had to serve in Korea. He decided that, you know, the life of a sergeant wasn't the life he wanted. So he went back to the University of Wisconsin and got an engineering degree and, um, and ended up at, uh, at HP, actually within days of when I joined HP. And he actually was the person I had gone to and asked what lead uh, of the transistor was the emitter. He also, uh, he also was one of my partner, one of the partners in the sailboat venture. Anyway, very good friend. Hired him to, to actually make this happen because basically most of the people that I had were really good at creating new things. But what I needed now was somebody to finish. And uh, he did. There were 78 boxes that were, uh, that were air shipped to Japan. They landed one week ahead of the April 1st deadline. And uh, we later found out how Sony, who had also received one of these contracts and who never delivered a working system, ended up in the good graces of the Japanese government. They said, oh, we've delivered the product. The software will come later. So the first dual frequency survey receivers were purchased by the Japanese government for their earthquake monitoring system. Oh, by the way, I've got another slight diversion back. Uh, when we did the deal with Pioneer, I knew that we had to figure out, well, uh, they had the right to have an engineer you know, while they transferred the technology. Um, and what, what I had been advised was the Japanese typically came into a small American company and just sucked all of the technology out of the small American company. So what I had done was I had sold them the, uh, the generation of technology that was in production. I was halfway through, maybe two thirds of the way through getting to the next level, you know, which would give me the cost savings and, and all the rest of the stuff. Well, within six weeks, Pioneer had driven the factory cost of our existing product below where our target was for the next generation. Uh, this was incredibly chilling. So uh, actually, this is the first time I actually stole, well, or pilfered, or whatever you want to call it, enticed away.